Right, recording? Yeah. Okay. So last week we spoke to uh, reproduction and we did mention the importance of <laughs> critical. Why is one of the reasons why reproduction is important? Somebody help me out. Why is reproduction so important? So that species wouldn't go extinct. Very good, right? So without if it without reproduction, we always have to remember that uh, without reproduction, we disappear as a species. So hence the importance of reproduction. Hence the reason why when you look at things like sperm count for the male, that is why so many millions of sperm are produced uh, in terms of the ejaculate fluid because of the fact you want to increase the probability of fertilizing that egg. And the reason why that is so important because fertilization is important because of the fact of having birth is critical for the survival of the species itself. So therefore reproduction is critical. We looked at different hormones involved with reproduction. We looked at the fetus and the fetal circulation. And we mentioned certain adaptations that the fetus has prior to birth, which are critical for its survival, namely in terms of the exchange of blood or not, or not really exchange of blood, sorry, because there's no exchange of blood between the mother and the fetus, but exchange of nutrients across the placenta, exchange of gases, nutrient gases, particularly oxygen to the fetal circulation and uh, the removal of waste carbon dioxide from the fetal circulation, it diffuses across into the maternal cir circulation. So anything that could diffuse from mother to child, of course, is antibodies. That is how initially, in terms of protection within the womb, some of the maternal antibodies actually help protect the fetus in utero or while it is in the uterus itself. But there's no blood exchange between mother and fetus, except there's some type of trauma which occurs, right, which could lead to um, bleeding internally and you could have you know the blood actually physically crossing the placenta in that regard when there's some trauma done and the, you have damage to the um, placenta itself but normally there's no exchange of blood there's only exchange of gases in terms of as i just mentioned oxygen co2 and nutrients from the mother to the um, fetus. In terms of adaptation to fetal circulation, we did mention that you do have uh, an adaptation where you bypass the liver, because one of the things you have to recognize with the liver, structurally, the liver is the biggest organ within the human body itself. If you were to think about it, for those of us who go to the grocery, anybody here like to eat liver? Yes, Chicken sir. liver? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. One of the things when you're cooking it, can't cook it too long, most critically, right? You cook it too long, it gets grainy. But if you were to look at, let's say, human liver, the, li the liver is the largest organ by mass within the body itself. It's about the width of your body. It goes right across, you know, in terms of the size of the liver. And one of the, if you were to think about the circulation, the blood circulation, right, the hepatic artery that goes to the liver and then uh, actually distributes to all the cells of the liver itself. If you were to just remove all the liver tissue and just look at the distribution, it's a lot of blood distribution that goes on. It's a lot of, you know, little roadways, pathways in terms of the arteries, arterioles, veins and venules that go all the way through the liver itself. So one of these things, if the blood that is coming back, oxygen rich blood, after picking up oxygen from uh, diffusion across the placenta from the from the mother, oxygen rich blood is now being returned to the fetus. If it were to go through the liver, because of all of this roadway, you know, it's like going from San Fernando to Chaguanas, right? If you go on the highway, boom, right? You're reaching, and it doesn't have traffic, you'll reach there in no time. But if you take the old road, right? You go through, you know, go around, um, down by Marabella, you go through there, Point of Pierre, Ting Ling Ling, you go through Claxon Bay, all on the old road. It goes very slowly. And if you think about it in that regard, in terms of the blood going through the liver, if it were to just go through the baby's liver, it will take too long. And as it goes along, it'll be losing oxygen, such that when it does reach the heart in terms of circulating to the other tissues, the oxygen content will be too low. So that is why the, the body, and as I always say, the body is a fantastic machine. It has this adaptation in terms of where it bypasses the liver, most of the blood. You just have a very minimal amount going through the uh, fetal liver, but it bypasses the liver altogether and goes directly towards or into the heart. When it reaches the heart as well, does it need to go into the lungs? Absolutely not. 
Because if it does go into the lungs, remember these lungs are fluid filled. So the gaseous exchange in terms of within the baby itself, you wouldn't have a lot of oxygen exchange occurring in the fetal lungs. So what it does again, you have another shunt, right? The foramen ovale, the blood goes directly through the wall of the heart into the other side. So it bypasses the pulmonary circulation, doesn't go into the lungs itself. There is, however, some blood that does go into the pulmonary artery. Um, in terms of going towards the um, lung itself. And those that, the blood that does go there, there's another shunt uh, from the pulmonary artery directly into the aorta. Because one thing, you don't want the blood to go really into the lungs because these lungs are fluid filled and minimal amount of oxygen exchange you'll get right there. All right, so those are three adaptations that the fetus has. One, in terms of bypassing the liver. Two, in terms of bypassing the pulmonary circulation by going through the foramen ovale. And three, by bypassing the blood that does go through the pulmonary artery, bypassing the route to the uh, lungs by going from the uh, pulmonary artery directly into the aorta, right? So now it, it enters into the circulation. So the oxygen-rich blood, which has come as a result of the exchange of oxygen from the uh, maternal circulation to the fetal circulation, now this oxygen-rich blood could go through uh, throughout the fetus. We good? Hello? Yes, sir. All right. All right. So we looked at that last day. All right. So now we're going to start with inheritance and life, which is today's um, topic. All right. So let's go. So what is life? You know, some people might say life is life. For those of us who follow football, I know who, which, which football icon passed away this week. Anybody? Maradona. Diego, Diego Armando Maradona. Yeah, where was he from? Argentina. Argentina, and how old was he? 60. And what was the cause of death? Heart attack. What you saying, young? What you saying? Beverly is full of football. A so little bit. Husband, not really oh. me, but my husband. <laughs> yeah, 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 Beverly. But he was really an outstanding um, talent. I don't know if ever you also videos of him. And one of the things that I was reading just this morning, you know, in, in um, uh, on social media, that in Italy, because he played most of his football at Napoli, and when he went there, Napoli was like, I want the song about all due respect, it was like Trinidad. So just imagine Trinidad, you know, football, uh, we're there, but you know. Uh, and when, after he came, after about two years, they went from being at the bottom of the table you know, to also from an also run club to the number one club in Italy. That's equivalent. Let's say Trinidad, imagine like beating Brazil on a regular basis, something like that for those who follow football. So he was really a phenomenal talent. And what I remember is there's this video, you could probably look at it on YouTube. Um, in the background, there's a song, Life is Life, and it shows him juggling a ball. And they say in Italy this week, this weekend, all the stadia in terms of respect for him, they're going to be showing that little clip, showing him juggling this ball. And um, they're going to be showing it, oh yeah. And in the background is this song, Life is Life. So as I, as I saw this word here, life, it reminded me of the song, Life is Life. If we have time, I'll probably play it at the end of class. But life is life, indeed. When form and function combine to produce biological activity, right, we call it life. And if I were to ask you, when does life begin? When we are looking at reproduction, when does life begin? Some people um, from religious traditions, they say conception. When we talk about conception, what are we talking about biologically? Let me use that term, conception. When the egg becomes fertilized. Be a little more specific, yes, yes. The Be a little more. At the, um, when, okay, hold on, let me see if I can try to, somebody else can answer in the meantime. But no, but you're right there, Hanifa. You're quite right. And if we do get anything better, we'll use what you said there. I just wanted a little bit more specificity, a little bit more gravy on the rice. Anybody? In terms of the definition, but Hanifa is quite right. After, after the egg becomes fertilized, it becomes embedded into the... The uterine wall. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Right. And you're saying, okay, both of y'all 
uh, both of you all said it, both, uh, Sophia, right, and Hanifa, you all said it. So it's all about uh, fertilization. What I really wanted to say, wanted to hear, it says the union of sperm and ova, right? And in terms of religious traditions, you know, at least from the Christian tradition, that is what, and I do believe other traditions, well, I can't speak for other traditions, but from the Christian tradition, that is when it is believed life enters, right? When you have the sperm and the ova, when you have that fusion occurring, that is what is known uh, fusion to form the zygote. That is when it is believed from the Christian religious tradition, that is when life is inserted. So life begins at that time, right? Prior to that, of course, you have a separate sperm and you have a separate, in terms of the male genetic information, female genetic information in the ovum, sperm has the male genetic information, right? Well, information from the male, sorry. And now when this zygote is formed, ah, this is when life begins, according to the uh, Christian religious tradition. From a biological perspective, similarly, it is known as the zygote fusion of male and female uh, gametes, right? The sperm and the ovum, you know, fuse to form this zygote. So when form and function combine, it, it is, it is um, produced biological activity, it is called life. And these are just some of the terms associated with it, right? So some of these terms, uh, let's just have a quick look at them. Genome, all of the genes come into a single species. And when we look at the human genome, approximately how many genes do we have? Anybody? And so hazard, I guess, how many genes do you think we have? Let me give you a hint. Is it A, less than 500, B, less than 5,000, C, less than 20,000, or D, less than 50,000? Uh-huh, anybody? Less than 50,000. Well, well, it wouldn't be wrong to say that, but you could be a little more, you're, you're on your right <laughs> I like that, you choose the upper most limit. Yeah, very good, less than 20. It's, it's, approximately about 12,500 genes we have. But, but that was a badly phrased question because if you put less than 50,000, it would imply 12,500 is less. But I should have given a range. I should have given a range, sorry. But yeah, it's approximately 12,500 genes that we have. And this encompasses or gives us everything, everything that we know about a human being. Interestingly enough, um, to, to uh, in terms of a, something that is true, the human, uh, it's another, sorry, not the human, but the fly, the common fly, the fruit fly, the Sophila melanogaster, that has actually more genes than us, you know, go figure. So think about it, a fly has more genes than us, but look at, it's, it's a fly, right? And look at us, you know, we have less genes than a fly and, you know, we are, we are bigger, we are more complex, you know, ability, cognitive ability, the ability to rationalize and think, it is, as far as we know, it is much more complex than that of a fly. Okay, let's go forward. So in terms of the traits, qualities such as hair color that results from the expression of one or more genes, this is very important because these are things which are inherited and are passed along from our parents. Monogenic diseases, which are controlled by a single and then gene, and you have polygenic, which are results of the influence of multiple genes. Alleles, these are alternate version of a gene as it occurs on the chromosome of a pair. So very interestingly, you have dominant and recessive alleles. So the dominant, it expresses itself even when it is recessive, and the recessive expresses only when you have both pairs being present. A genotype is a person's unique set of genes, whereas a phenotype, this is the physical characteristic, that's what you see. So the genotype will, let's say for eye color, is represented, let's say, by big G, big G, you know, you're writing it down to write the genotype which is representative of the eye color. And let's say for brown, you put a big, a capital B. And let's say black, um, you put a common B. That is where brown is dominant to black, right? But what you actually see in the offspring, what you physically could see, right? Now you can't see somebody's genes because these genes 
Remember, they are in the cells, they are in your cells within the nucleus. You have the 23 pairs of chromosomes, and on the chromosomes, you have these stretches uh, of information, which are known as genes. And these genes usually code for something very specific within the human body, be it, um, let's say, hair, or size of nose hole, or teeth. All of these things are coded on these 23 pairs of chromosomes, which are found in the nucleus, which is found within a cell. So, in terms of looking at these, Gene, which is why when you speak about genotype, you can't actually see it. But the phenotype is what is represented and the, what you physically can see. So for instance, you could see hair color, you could see eye color, you could see um, size of nose, size of hair, all of these things are under, which are under the control of the genes. But what you could physically see, this is known as the phenotype. All right, so here is um, karyotypes. So we're looking at the 23 pairs of chromosomes. Notice we have 22 pairs, 22 pairs here, which are known as the autosomes and one pair of sex chromosome. Now, could somebody tell me, looking at the sex chromosome of a female and a male, what difference do, could you say exists between male and female chromosomes, the sex chromosome? One of the male sex chromosome is not, uh, well, I'd say not fully formed. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. Good. And in, in saying that, what are you really see? You could say that in a different way in terms of genetic information. More or less. Which one has more and which one has less? Trust your eyes. Who has more? The sex chromosome might have more. The male or the female has more. Looking at these two. Which one has more genetic information? Which one has more chromosomes? Male or the female? The female. The female has more, yeah. So piggybacking on what was said, thanks very much for for uh, that contribution. Yes, the sex chromosome. You can see there's less in the male. So some people might want to argue, you know, that you know females are more intelligent. Who knows what you know what, in terms of what is information is there? Maybe it's patience, kindness, gentleness, maternal instincts, and all of these things. Whereas in men, right, it's absent. It's physically not there. And some people might want to say when they are, let's say, they, are, they have an argument which arises between themselves and their significant other, you know, they might turn to him and say, hey, don't worry with you now, you chupid. You know why you're chupid? Because in your sex chromosome, a lot of information missing. That's why it is naturally stupid. Yeah, yeah. Please do not bring up that argument. There's always a time and a place for everything, but I assure you, the outcome might not be of the best. So don't go telling people that they have less men, that they have less genetic information. Granted, it is true, right? But don't bring it up, you know, when, when tempers are heated. Anybody ever do that? Bring up that, that argument with, any, with a male? No. Okay, good. So you all know about that. All right, so very importantly, the two Ys, now, in terms of X and Ys, which one is male and which one is female? X, X, and X, Y. Which one is male, which is female? The X, Y is male and X, X is female. X, Y is male, right? And X, X is female, right? Uh, that is, the, thank you, your name, right? X, X, and X, Y. Now, how do you remember that? How, is there a way you could remember that? You know, the, the female is X, X, and the male is X, Y? How do you remember that? So I believe you call it chromatids, but half part of a chromatid is does be missing from the male. So that's right. how you know it's X Y. Yeah, correct. Yeah, no, but I, I just saying you know in terms of remembering. So let's say in the heat of an exam, let's say you know the question come up, which of these represents um, a male? You know, a, a male of the species A X X B X Y C Y Y or D none of the above. You know, how would you remember it? You know, so let me you know. have two different letters and female have the same letters. Yeah, okay, true. And hey, whichever way is fine with you. How I remember it, right? Remember, we just talked about how male have less information than a female. Yeah, because as you can see here, right, they're missing a piece. So think about the letter X and you break off piece of X. When you break off a piece of an X, it turns into a Y, yeah? That makes sense? If you break off an arm of an X. Right, you know, it's like two V's. So if you take off one part, I uh, sorry, I can't draw it for you all. But oh, I could technically, right? So you know how? Okay, so our X and our X is female. So if you take off like this, you know, the bottom part of the X here, 
right? You're left with a Y, right? So that, that's how I remember it then, you know? If it has, let's just think about this here. So this looks like an X. If you take off this piece here, right? You're left with this, this, and the down part, which is a Y, you yeah? know? So at least that's how I remember it in terms of X, X, and X, Y. However, where you do it, that's perfectly fine. So in terms of analysis, here we are looking at it in terms of X, X, and X, Y, right? Very importantly, um, in terms of the males, XY, females, XX, right? And the whole notion of dominance and recessiveness. What does that mean? When, so, when you say something in terms of the allele, which is alternate forms of a gene, when something is dominant as opposed to something is recessive? Well, dominant, it means that if it is present in the heterozygous form, in terms of you have both of them together, this will show, this trait will show. Whereas with the recessive, the only way this trait will show is if you get um, one from the mother and one from the father, as it's shown here. So Julia, this is a homozygous recessive disease. She get, she got one from the, in terms of the traits or the genes, one from the father, this common C, and she got one from the mother. So this is why in this case, you'll have the diseased states, all right? These two, in which you have the heterozygous state um, being maintained, big C, small C, these will be carriers. And then you'd have one, in terms of both of them having capital C's. Now, in terms of all of this information, how do we know this is true? There was somebody who did the research on this. Anybody knows his name? He was actually a monk. Anybody knows his name? It begins with M. Six letters and it rhymes with Handel. Dixian, yeah? And his name was mm, not Handel, but Mendel. Mendel, right? So Mendel, uh, he was a guy. He did some research on peas. And why did he do research on peas in terms of figuring out these combination? Why did he do research on peas? Anybody knows? Why didn't he do research on, let me say, um, bygone? Or why he didn't do research on corn? Why did he choose peas? Any ideas? I don't know, Esther, but that's so where they coined the term two peas in a pod. I don't know. That's I like, like, have... it could be even from under, you're quite right in that regard because of the fact that he did a lot of work with peas. And, and you might be right, even going back to that. So why peas? Why do they say two peas in a pod? It, it is not overtly. Um, the reason is not overt, but there's a reason why he chose peas. He chose peas because peas was in abundance. Yeah. Okay. Yes, in abundance. And why was it in, ab in abundance? Because, if you go, um... if you go in the market and you see one set of peas all over the place selling, what does that tell you? It's in season. It's in season, yes, yes. And something else I'll tell you. Is it that they were growing, a lot of people were making them or? Why would they grow a lot of it, yes. So why do you think, if you're a farmer, why would you grow a lot of one particular crop as opposed to growing something else? Mm. A very simple reason, go overthink it. Why would you want to grow it to go and sell it? You're, you're growing one particular thing and not the others. Why? Why would you do that? Thank you very much, Aaliyah. Yes, yes. So back in the day, if you can imagine, peas was the big thing, right? They did lots of trading in peas, you know? Peas was the, was the item out there. Lots of trading. People would buy it all the time. So the, the people who were involved with peas and selling peas and so on, they were like, look, you know, of course, different types of peas give di bring different prices. So peas show different traits in terms of the color, in terms of being wrinkled or smooth and so on. So they were like, look, you know, let me see if we could figure out and send somebody to university to figure this thing out, to do some research on peas. And who did they choose? Ah, Gregor Mendel, he was a smart fella. He didn't have custard back then, right? But they figure out, you know, he, he was in primary school and he was smart. So they say, okay, Mandel, here we're going on. We'll send you to university and we want you to study some peas. And Gregor was like, and if you do that, we'll pay for you. 
Gregor was like, okay. And the thing is, back in the day, in terms of the universities, all the universities were run by Catholic institutions. So you had to become a priest or a monk in order to actually continue with your university studies. It wasn't like, no. So if it was, if, in other words, if we were to take a start and throw it back in the, in, at that time, right? Everybody here would be monk and priest, right? Because that was the only way you could go to university to study, right? You had to go into a religious institution to actually do it. So a monastery. So he went to a monastery and this is how he was able to learn about you know biology uh, mathematics and so on and then he applied it to genetics so he chose it wasn't really that he chose peas it was more like peas chose him and he did his research on peas because of the fact that his benefactors they wanted um, to find out information about the peas and that's why he did it okay so we mentioned this in terms of heterozygous and uh, homozygous homozygous heterozygous uh, for recessive traits, they are the carriers, and they do not exhibit the trait. The heterozygous for dominant, they do exhibit the traits, as we just mentioned there. And this is just colorblindness inheritance, right, in terms of it, right, the mother and the father, and Kate and Leah looking at it. But let's, look, let's just look at the phenotypes in terms of colorblindness. You have a normal male, normal female, and the carrier, but in terms of colorblind male, it is carried here, it is just one in terms of a recessive um, allele. Uh, here, here it is that Tom has it because he just has the recessive phenotype XR, right? And the phenotype that is shown, he'll be a colorblind male. And when you're colorblind, when, what happens when you're colorblind? Any, anybody here colorblind by, okay, I, want to, I don't want you to throw out your business, but when, when you're colorblind, what happens? You have trouble distinguishing between two particular colors. What are those colors? Red and green. Red, green colorblindness. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Anifa. So you have trouble differentiating between those two colors. I kid you not. I remember when I was writing CXC back in the day and we went to the <laughs> chemistry lab, right? And we had... Um, for the chemistry lab, we had a particular test um, that was being done, I think involving uh, copper sulfate or something like that. So you do have a color change from blue to green in terms of, of, of when you add, I don't remember whatever it was. But I do remember, however, one of my colleagues going up to the front desk, you know, and telling them, um, excuse me, I can't see the color change because I'm colorblind, you know. And the thing was, you know, I was in school with him for five years, didn't know he was colorblind. Or, and it was only now, you know, he chose to reveal it. I, I just found it was special. Yeah. OK, let's go forward. All right. Life. We look at inheritance of, of genes and now stages of life. When we're looking at stages here. Here we see baby, uh, youth, uh, baby, to sorry, a, a toddler. Here we see, you know, a little young man. Here we see youth, and now an older gentleman here. And similarly here, your baby pictures, right? Uh, so as we grow, as you grow older, what changes happens in terms of the body? Well, in terms of your proportions, one of the things you notice, in terms of the proportions, what changes as you go from a three-month-old to an adult? What changes do you notice? Weight. Weight, yes. So what about the weight, Dixian? Um, so I believe that when it is you're growing, you, you tend to lose the weight that you had from a baby. In terms of because the fat? Because it would be, yeah, it would be more active. I understand what you're saying, proportionately. So when you look at babies, babies aren't born with muscles like this. But as you know, as you get older, more proportionately, the baby fat, you either lose the baby fat. That is true. Anything else changes in terms of from a three-month-old to an adult? What other things changes? Thanks, Dixian. What else changes? Hair growth. Hair growth. Ah, good point. Yeah. Hair growth. Yeah, as you get older. With some people, it actually regresses. Anybody ever see a baby with like an afro when they're born? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, one set of hair. It is absolutely incredible. You know, some people born with one set of hair. I, I don't know what's the genes controlling hair growth. And then it'll be interesting to note. I know some people, some babies are born bald virtually. And you know, sometimes it's rather interesting with, with women. Let's say they have a daughter and the daughter have what, three strand of hair. And what they try to do, take that three strand and wrap it around a clip or wrap a ribbon around it. Yeah. 
making the child look like a little present, but it's only three grain a year the child have, right? So it's rather interesting. I don't know how they do it. It's really a lot of finger dexterity goes on there, right? But it will be interesting, I would say, if there's a correlation that when you're born, let's say that when you're bald, if later in life you will become bald, it'll be interesting to know if there's that correlation, you know, between baldness at birth, as opposed to let's say when you start to get, let's say you start to hit your thirties or forties or, or later on, if there's that correlation. Anybody has ever done an informal study or look at pictures where they have seen a connection between let's say a bald baby and being bald later in life? Yes, sir. Yeah, have you seen yeah. a connection, Hanifa? Is it? My Is it? cousin. Uh. Yeah, she was bald and now she has a full head of thick, thick, thick hair. What you saying? So that yeah. disprove, it disproves the possible theory then that if you're born ball, that you know you'll be born later in life. Yeah. yeah, that is true. That is good. Yeah, great. Let's go on. Right. So in terms of body proportions, the head gets smaller. You know, proportionately. Let's look. We look at the head. Let's if we use this distance. One, two, three, four. So our baby's about four heads tall. When you look at this one, one, two, three, four five, six, a, a grown adult is like seven heads tall. So that means with babies, their heads get proportionately smaller as they get older, they shrink, right? And which is why oh, when it, oh, go ahead. Sorry, not, not, the, well, not, not well. Oh, sorry, I said that wrongly. Thanks for correcting me. Not the head shrinks, the body gets larger in relation to the size of the head. The head doesn't shrink, <laughs> but that's quite right, right? But the body gets larger. So in other words, the baby, a toddler, a three month old, you're like five heads tall. Let me see, one, two, three, about four heads tall. But as you get to this stage, you're like seven heads tall. So proportionately, your, your body gets larger in relation to the size of the head, which is why when you look at dolls, dolls have big heads and they also have big eyes. Right, if you notice proportionately to the size of the face, right, the head gets bigger in relation to the size of the eyes. It gets longer and so on. That's why dolls usually have these big eyes. And you, you're looking at it and you say, oh, how cute. And you don't know why. Tapping into your maternal instinct more likely than not. You know, you're seeing a baby. And that goes equally for males and females, right? So, you know, you see it. We have a soft spot for babies. And that's why these dolls usually have these large eyes. They're making it look like a baby as much as possible. Yeah. All right, so in terms of senescence or the slowing down of, of organs and structures within the body, let's see what happens, right? As you get older, right, the brain and nerves, um, it begins to uh, get smaller and slow down. As the hair cells die, so of course, anybody have granny when they're starting to talk with them and what they're saying, what, what, you don't hear as well, right? Hi. Yeah, it happens. But she was here when you're talking about money. I don't know. <laughs> Quite so. Selective hearing. Selective hearing. Quite so. Right? But something, yeah, when I hear money, mm, suddenly, yes, yeah, they get very good at it. The lungs, they get hardened and weakened respiratory muscles. So therefore, Granny can no longer could run 100 meters, right, in terms of breathing, you know, it's, it's a little more, they move a little slower. Heart, the cardiac output decreases in terms of the circulation. The endocrine hormone secretion decreases. The skin, it becomes more fragile and sometimes a little wrinklier. Wrinklier, I don't know if that's a word, it becomes more wrinkled. The muscle, the muscle mass decreases, right? So even anybody know any old bodybuilders? Somebody who was like a bodybuilder younger in life and now they hit in the 60s or 70s. That same muscle mass that they had, right? It begins to disappear. They're no longer as large as they were before. I was looking um, on, on at an online um, clip uh, showing you, there's this, this, I don't remember who he was, but there was this, this guy, a, a Chinese actor, very big, very buff when he was younger, right? And he's acting these movies and he had some rather sick lips. That's how I remember him. Remember him, a Chinese guy. And he's acting a lot of movies. And now he's like in his 60s or early 70s. And he was very, very buff. And he used to, you know, when he used to um, be in the movies, he used to dance his pecs, you know, dance them up and down. And now if you see how small, you know, he has gotten rather small, which just goes link truth to what we are saying here in terms of your muscle mass decreasing. Even though you, while you were younger, you had more muscle mass, but as you get older, it decreases. Bones, very importantly, they get more brittle, 
right? And that is why it's very important not to play musical chairs with granny and pull away the chair from under her because you don't want fractures to occur, particularly in the area of the hip. Why is it important not to get older people, persons to get a fracture in their hip? Why, why, is, why is that very important? Let's say above 70 years, you don't want them getting fractures in their hip. Why is that so? So does it take long to heal? Yep, you hit the nail on the head there earlier, yes. Yeah, it takes very long to heal. Not only that, you would recognize that this is a pivot. This is one of your girdles, of course, the other girdle being your pectoral girdle in your shoulder. Everything really pivots around this area, your torso as well as your lower limbs. If you get a fracture, one, it takes long to heal, but not only that, two, it's very difficult to keep it quiet. Because, you know, and that, that helps in, in, in slowing down the healing process. So if you do get a fracture, very long, it takes long to heal. And because of the decreased mineral composition, sometimes it doesn't heal at all. And therefore, they'll have to go in and do some hip replacement surgery, right? So that is something that you do have to keep in mind in terms of, of um, granny. Don't play musical chairs with granny and pull away the chair from her. Liver, the liver shrinks. <laughs> as you get older, as shown here, right? Blood vessels, the degenerative changes in arteries increase the incidence of atherosclerosis and hypertension, right? Let me see if I could blow this up so you all can see it a little close, uh, better. That's a little better. Um, yes, sir. Uh-huh, let me see if I get the hand here, right. Okay, so the eyes, the lens harden causing Pres, 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 presbyopia, which is farsightedness, right? So, and of course, what are the diseases of the eyes older persons get? Glaucoma. Glaucoma is one, right? Which other one? Sometimes begin with C. Cataract. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, cataract. And you will see that in your professional career a lot, right? In terms of cataracts, right? The cloudiness associated with the lens. And how do, how do they fix uh, one person with cataracts? How do they fix that? What do they do in terms of the surgery? Literally, what Go ahead. Something. I think they cut something in your eye. Yeah, okay. and they say you're quite no, you're quite true, and so they literally they replace the lens because the lenses are cloudy. They physically go in and they take out the lens and they put in a false lens, right? So they take out the lens because it's cloudy. If you could just imagine, if you're wearing glasses and somebody put Vaseline over the glasses, you know, and just imagine you wouldn't be able to see anything. So what they do is literally they go in and they take out the lens and they put in an artificial lens and then they adjust your vision by giving you glasses in that regard. So that's what they do in terms of cataract surgery. Right? Anybody have family who, who had cataract surgery? Yeah, my mother had cataract surgery. My aunt had cataract surgery. Plenty of people in my family, I, I better not watch my eyes, but yeah, go on anyway. But yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. For the cataracts, do they also do like the laser? How does Correct. That How, what do they do? In terms of the cutting ability. So um, as opposed to physically cutting, they use a the laser to make the incision. So that's what they do. But they physically have to remove the lens. So they use the laser. Remember the laser, one of the things, it could cut because it's high energy. So as opposed to using, let's say, a scalpel and physically cutting, they would go mm -hmm. in a blade of some sort. They, they'll use the laser to make the incision and they have to physically remove the lens and replace it with another lens. So one of the things, um, being an informed person within the medical field, if you're, let's say somebody, you're going with granny or your aunt or whomsoever to the doctor, ask them what type of lens, you know, don't ask them that, what type of lens are, do you um, use, right? Just ask them that name, the brand name, just ask them for that. What's the brand name of the lens they use? And then you could go and do some research on it in terms of the lens, because there are different types of lenses that you could use and you want to ensure that they're using the, you know, one that is on the up and up as it were. So that's one good question that you could ask, you know, if it is a carry somebody to have cataract surgery. Um, the laser, one of the advantages of the laser using laser surgery is that the recovery time is less, right? Um, as opposed to when they do manual, let's say using a, a scalpel to make the incision or whatever, whatever fine blade they use to make the incision. I do know with the laser, it's uh, the recovery time is, is less. 
and um, possible trauma to the eye is less, you know, when they do use the laser. And of course, by extension, the laser is more expensive um, than the uh, using the traditional method of just going and making the incision and then removing the lens, right? But one of the advantages, one of the big advantages is uh, the recovery time is less, all right? Tongues, yes, you know, as you get older, taste buds, the taste buds die. So you have a little trouble distinguishing taste and so on. Blood vessel, we mentioned blood vessels, and of course with the brain and nerves. So many brains, you know, as they get older, what happens to older people as it relates to the brain as they get older? What happens? They forget a lot. Yeah, they forget a lot. And you might have a conversation with them, let's say, now and within 10 minutes they come back and have the same conversation with you, yeah? Mm -hmm. And what do you have to do in, time, in times like that? What are you supposed to do? Ignore them. <laughs> I was going to say be patient. <laughs> but, but just be patient with them. Yeah, ignore them. You know, it, well, it takes us, not everybody could handle it. It takes a certain type of people, which is why person, in terms of gerontology. Anybody here want to get into gerontology? So what I am? Oh, that is um specialist nursing that deals with the elderly, taking care of older persons. Nah, so old people too miserable. I agree. That's why I say it takes a special kind of person. And I'm mad with you. Some people just cannot handle it. So if you know that you can't handle it, please don't get into the field, right? That's like when you go by KFC. You know, some people are not people people. And they go and they work at KFC. And what happened when you go on KFC and what is it? What day does have Cruncher special? The two sandwich for, for whatever um, price. It's Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. And 10 to 1, when you go by a place, hello, I could get two Cruncher. What's the first thing they'll tell you? We are, no crunch. we are no Cruncher. And they're watching you. <laughs> so what do you say? Well, OK, um, let me get two Zinger. And what do they say? We are no Zinger. <laughs> and they're watching you. You know, you're like, dude, you know? So very importantly, in terms of, as we mentioned, for gerontology, if that is not your thing, leave it alone, right? And just move on where that is concerned. All right, okay. Let's go on. All right, so senescence is slowing down um, of the body itself as you get older, it does happen. All right, very important to note as well, even within the mitochondria, interesting things happen. Let me see if I can explain. I'll touch on it ever so briefly, because this is not really on the syllabus. Um, the mitochondria, not only does it produce ATP, but it produces what are known as free radicals. And these free radicals, well, even though, uh, in normal mitochondria, you don't have a lot of these um, free radicals being produced when they're young. You have a lot of ADP and a lot, very small amount of these free radicals. And these free radicals, they could cause damage to the mitochondrial DNA. But uh, when you're younger, or when the mitochondria are relatively um, healthy, yeah, a lot of ATP, not much of this. But as you get older, what happens? The amount of ATP that you, is produced is decreased, and you have more of this free radical, free radicals being produced. And what these free radicals do, they cause damage to the mitochondrial, the mito DNA mitochondria. And by extension, it causes damage to the mitochondria itself. D right, the DNA within the mitochondria, this leads to abnormal um, mitochondria being produced, right? And what does this lead to? Well, there's this uh, disease called progeria. I, uh, I haven't, you do have some, I think I might have seen a couple of cases in your lifetime, let's say within your professional career, you mightn't see too much of it, too many of them here in Trinidad. Should you go abroad um, to find your place of work, you might see more of it abroad. But this is a case where young people look very old, right? And in terms of progeria, in terms of the outcome, usually they, they, they be very, the age at which they usually pass is within their 20s. So they don't usually live beyond 30 in terms of this. But what you have happening is a rapidly, not only do the mitochondria age, but by extension, in terms of the physical appearance of the person, they have this aged appearance, all right? Okay. 
stress, wouldn't talk much of this because it's not on the syllabus, but all that to say, as we mentioned before, in this time of COVID, we are under a lot of stress and it is good to take time out for yourself to de-stress. Let me hear some things you could do to de-stress. What do you study. do to de-stress? Yes? Study sleep. or sleep? <laughs> oh, you say a mouthful there, Hanifa. Yeah, sleep. Sleep is good for de-stress and anything else? Wait, listen, to music. listen to music? Where is that there, Aaliyah? Yes, sir. What kind of music you like? Gospel? What a friend we have in <laughs> Jesus. Mostly R&B, sir. R&B, I hear you. But listening to music, very relaxing indeed. Yeah. What else could we do to relax? Let me hear you. Anissa, what do you do to relax during this time of COVID? So, lime, I guess. <laughs> Line, take a right? Break from take a, oh, you say a mouthful there. Take a break from your normal routine. Take a break from school. Mm -hmm. That is very, <laughs> very important. Yep, go ahead. So my my um way to deal with stress kind of way, right, sir. Mm -hmm. But um when I do not sort of school, so and like I want to get a break, I just find I just find chores to do. Oh, I told you I was going to tell me just cover yourself with ketchup and throw some oh, bread sir. on top of you. It's that would have been weird. I, I, it's like, it's like um, when I want to think just so I just like find, like if I know the house at the sleep, I would just go and sleep the house. Or, or that is a sleep. very good. And the reason why, because it's something very structured. So, you know, yeah. like for instance, if it is, okay, I have to go and mop the kitchen, I have yeah, to fully yeah. pail, put some um, disinfect any water, put a little detergent, go carry the bucket with the mop in the in the kitchen, start them up, ring them up. So, you know, you're doing things in sequence and in doing these things, yeah, it, it, it calms it down because it takes you away from, let's say, stressing about your work and so on. So it's a detachment away from it. And it's a very good way, I'm glad. And that's a very, product, uh, that's a very positive way in terms of doing cleaning. Very, very good. Very good. Anybody else? What does it do to keep the stress level down? Okay, I guess people, you know, they so do. you can exercise. Yeah, by all means, exercise. And even, you know, the previous speaker they mentioned, Aliyah mentioned doing chores. You know, that's a real nice way to exercise. Bend down, squeeze them up, bend down, full water, carry the pail, walk in, walk in, lift the pail, pull it down, lift. Very good way of exercising as well. Doing chores, it's a very good way. But glad you do it. Exercise, yeah, very good. Anything else? One more thing and then we move on. How else you, you de-stress yourself? Eat chocolate. Eat chocolate. Chocolate has certain, um, what's the active ingredient in chocolate? I forget. It has certain things, yeah, which does calm you down. Which is why, like, for instance, we might find, like, you know, let's say you're feeling a certain way and you're like, oh, gosh, I'm feeling for a chocolate cake. I'm feeling for, you know, chocolate. Ha I forget the active ingredient. But it has things in it that, yes, are associated with calming you down. You're quite right. So I'm not mad at you. Go ahead with your chocolate in whichever form or fashion, right? That is very another way as well. But do whichever way, you know, you do it, it is important, especially during this COVID-19 time. And in particular, now, for instance, you might find yourself in close quarters with people that previously, you know, you had physical distance from, let's say, particularly with any family, you know? You know, normally it would just say go to school or what have you not. So it does bring about a little stress. So do keep in mind, you know, to keep that stress at bay. And this is just talking to some of the stresses and how you um, adjust to them. This is not uh, really on the syllabus. I wouldn't really uh, spend much time on it in terms of oxygen consumption and VMAX. It just speaks to this in terms of training, how it uh, brings that up. All right. In terms of uh, aging and death, some of the things which accelerate aging, right? Environmental toxins, stress, free radicals, excess adiposity, which means as you get fatter, you know, as you pour on a little bit of adipose or fat tissue, right? That could accelerate the aging process. So, of course, as mentioned, in terms of dealing with the stress, very importantly to exercise, that is one of the things that actually retard or slows it down. Taking antioxidants, we mentioned those free radicals which are produced in the mitochondria, that is those oxygen species, right? The O2 minus, right? Those free radicals. So, what you could do is use antioxidants, 
right? So the oxidant species, oxygen species O2 minus to combat it, you take something against it. So anti means against, oxidant refers to oxygen species. So these antioxidants could um, combat those uh, free radicals or the oxygen radicals which are produced in the mitochondrion as a result of respiration. And what are some examples of antioxidants out there? Well, you get in your food, right? Or, or in drinks. Anybody in know of any? In berries, yes, yes, yes. In terms of antioxidants. Anywhere else? Citrus juices, yes, yes. It's like orange juice. You might see it on some of the packets, you know, in the grocery. Antioxidant, right? In terms of orange juice, yes. So juices from citrus fruits and particularly berries, they do contain antioxidants as well as certain foods. Anybody know of any types of food that have anti that has antioxidant um properties so the ram rambutan or something like mm -hmm. that you get the name right anybody know about a rambutan or whatever it is yes, yeah it looks like a, a pumpsy day seed that dip in yes. red yeah, it's, it has a very strange <laughs> appearance but that is really good it really is um and you know as i always tell people you know um, especially local foods, eat it because in terms of your body recognizes it, you know, um, they'd recognize it quicker than let's say something foreign like strawberries or anything like that. But local foods in terms of your ancestors or those who went before you, they would have been exposed to it. So the body would have recognized it and pass on some ways to even metabolize or use it in their genes. So that's how we tell persons, yes. Eating foreign foods good, but if you could get it locally, yeah, you most definitely. Find it in, um, in beans too, sir. You could find it in beans, and in fact, you could find mm -hmm. it in oranges, strawberry, kiwi, avocado, carrot, um, broccoli, uh, dashing bush, as you mentioned there, spinach, ma pardon? And beetroot. Beetroot, yes, yes, mango, garlic, and there are lots of foods, grapefruit, tea, grapes, red wine, pumpkin, Long story short, you find it in virtually all fruits and vegetables, right? So any vegetable you could possibly think of that we grow down here, okra, all of those things, right? It has it. So all that as well points to the fact, you know, oh, don't forget to include vegetables and citrus and fruits in your diet because they do have antioxidant properties as well. All right, avoid unhealthy stress. You know, it have some people is that you just see them and you feel stressed out. I don't know, you ever walk in, like somebody walk into a room and you start to feel bad one time? You know, you got to start to get a bad feeling. Yeah, avoid them. Avoid them. Avoid unhealthy stress. Don't smoke and alcohol. Everything in moderation. Vi a diet rich in vitamins and minerals. Exercise regularly. And I can't, can't uh, stress this enough. Get enough sleep. That is so, so important. Sleep. Because during sleep as well, your body heals itself. It's a way of healing which occurs during sleep. A support network of family, friends, and pets. Everybody here have people they could talk to? Yes, sir. Right? Your BFF or a group of friends. Somebody you could just talk with. That is really important in terms of de-stressing. Right? Which is what I, yeah, go ahead. I just talked to my parrot. There you go. I am mad at you. Right? Yes. Yes. Very good, Aliyah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? But it's very, very important, which is why even within the chat, you know, if it is some issues straight out there, we were talking about, you know, assessment too, and somebody voiced the fact, hey, so, you know, we having plenty of exams coming along. Right? So what I did, I went and I talked with the CC, and I got some more time for you, and I put it back to Sunday as well. You know, so it's always good to avoid, as opposed to keeping it bottled up. Right, because when it literally, you know, you could worry yourself to death. You ever heard that saying? And it is true. It is very true. You mustn't internalize. It's good to, you know, verbalize it or at least come to some resolution concerning issues that you have. Because you have it in there and it's eating at you, it's eating at you. You find out you're getting a little sicky. You don't know why. And it's because of, you know, you have issues inside of there. 
So it's always good, you know, to verbalize it, you know, and I encourage you, you know, over the next, what, two or three weeks that we have, you know, if you do have issues with the course, put it within the WhatsApp group. Remember, the WhatsApp group is outside of Costat, and I will not quote you with it. I wouldn't do no screen capture and go and show the, the chair. Where, no, 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 no. There's some totally, and I value your privacy that whatever you put there, just consider it like that. I will not quote you on it. I will not take no screen capture or anything like that. And I just view it as a way for you to vent and let me know what is happening. All right, so within the chat, I just hope that you know you could feel you could feel that freedom, you know, just to say what you want to say. Because uh, again, too, it's, it's external to Costat, right? It's nothing, it, Costat has no belonging on it. And um, just a mean of communication there. Right? Spiritual beliefs and practice. Yes, yes. Prayer. Prayer. Is prayer important? Very. Very, very important. They have studies which are yeah, studies which have shown the importance of prayer in terms of outcomes for persons who are ill so even persons coming let's say and you would see it you know in your profession at the bedside during visiting hours and coming and praying with the person and so on that as well the power of prayer it has been documented in terms of studies done that it does help at whichever level well you could determine for yourself right but it, it does indeed help in terms of prayer and even for self it's a very good means of um relaxation i do know within the catholic tradition they have the um, they, they, they have the ability to go to confession. You know, that is a means of venting, right? Things that are bothering you. You know, when I, I, I slapped my daughter, but I didn't mean to, you know, you're, you're venting it, right? It's a good means of getting things out. And in a very similar way, when you do pray, you know, you pray to whichever, um, whichever channel you use in terms of your belief system. So do pray, and but it's very important to get it out there. Even if it is you don't believe in, let's say, a high, the existence of a higher power, not an issue, right? But it is important to do have some kind of communication where you're able to vent any issues that you have within you, as opposed to keeping them bottled up. That is getting you sick, most definitely, right? So do remember that. And new learning and happiness, right? In terms of the overall mental health, new learning, that's what you're all doing now, new learning, and I'm making you all happy, right? <laughs> but new learning is important, but always strive to get happiness regardless of where you're at. Always remember that happiness, you know, always strive towards that. Okay, we good? Everybody good? Yes, sir. All right, yes. you all want to do a little revision now? Ooh, everybody quiet, boy. What's up, sir? Yeah? Yes. Okay, I'll do a little bit and I'll send the rest, all right? So, so let me just pull up, let me just pull up the other one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not seeing the thing now. It disappear. Yes, now.
Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Okay. Got it. All right. Well, I got it. Why is this not open sesame? Come on, open up. Okay, I, I found it. Um, let me just get this. It's just taking its time to open. It does it sometimes, you know. Come on, come on. Life is life. Na 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 na. Na 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 come on. I really don't know why it's taking so long. Yeah, it's just taking its its time to open. So yeah, I'm guessing it it should just bear with me ever so briefly. All right, how y'all going? Everybody there? Are they still there? Yes, sir. yes sir. All right, good. Here we go. All right, yeah, okay, great. It come up. So I think is what I will do is share screen. You you all seeing it? No, no, sir. Okay. You don't see anything now? You don't see anything? Yeah, it's share screen loading. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. You're seeing something though, yeah? Yeah, something happening. I don't know. I don't know why, why it is it's taking its time. It, it eludes me. Uh, I just don't know. I just don't know. So we just have about half hour again, and then I'll, I'll call it a day. Because I don't want to overstress you all here. We just spoke about stress, yeah? Come on. Uh, OK, here we go. Mm -hmm. Na 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 na, la la la, life is life. Na 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 na, life is life. Everybody sing, life is life. Na 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 na. Okay, here we go. All right. Na na na, life is life. Na 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 na. I really have to play that song for you all for you to hear it. Okay. Okay, you all sing it. Yes? yes sir. Here we go. Okay, so we just we just go through this is the syllabus. And again, um I would I would send this to you all as well, the PowerPoint once I'm through. And it'll also be on the recording. All right. Let me see it recording. Yes. Okay. So in terms we started off with blood, right? And in terms of functions, we mentioned blood, transportation, regulation, and protection in terms of the different substances it contains what it regulates and in terms of the protection. When we look at blood, whole blood consists of both 
plasma and they formed elements. The formed elements consist of leukocytes or the white blood cells together with platelets. Platelets are very important in terms of the uh, production of or inhibiting blood flow when you do get a cut in terms of forming a plug all right, or a scab that occurs, platelets, very important where that is concerned. Erythrocytes, the red blood cells, critical as well in terms of the whole process of carrying oxygen through the, throughout the body itself. Within the plasma, it contains a lot of water, some proteins, and one of the more important proteins associated with the plasma, it's a carrier protein known as, found in eggs. The white of the egg is the albumin, right? So one of the more important proteins in the in the plasma is albumin. It's a carrier protein. That's like the equivalent of a maxitaxi. And the maxitaxi uh, carries things all over the body itself. Here are blood cells, right? And in this slide, which ones are the most numerous um, cells in the blood as shown here? What are we looking at? All of these tinglinglings here, what are they? Erythrocytes. Also known as? Red blood cells. Red blood cells. And why do they call them red blood cells? Because of the color. Yeah, because they're red. Yeah, yeah, right on, right? So red blood cells, because they are red. Here's a leukocyte, right? one of the white blood cells. Platelets, very important for coagulation and st uh, stopping um, blood, blood flow. If you didn't have platelets, what would happen internally? And you got a bruise, something that begins with H. It wouldn't heal, sir. It wouldn't heal, right? Very good. And when you have constant blood flow, and you know, you see, yeah, hemorrhaging. So lack of healing, key hemorrhaging that occurs internally. That's when you get blue black. You know, sometimes when you see blue black, that's actually blood. blood sir, can I ask uh, a question? Go ahead. So and when you're laughing, is vitamin K, I think, and that mm -hmm. could cause the clot, the clot, um, blood clots and those things. Yeah, it could cause yeah improper blood clotting if you lack vitamin K. That is very true. Yes, so it could cause then yeah improper blood clotting to occur. That's why it's always important not only to eat certain things but to eat things from a diverse variety of sources because you do, you get your vitamins from different things, right? And what is pus? If I tell you that, what is pus? Is pus a good thing or a bad thing? What would you say? Good. A good thing. Why you say that? Elaborate. Because that is how the um, immune and lymphatic system work to get rid of um, any disease causing organisms. So that's how they, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Get rid of it, excrete it um, in that sort of way. What is the major component of pus? It's dead cells. You're quite right in terms of from the immune system and the lymphatics, of course, that is where the immune system resides, the cells of the immune system. So we're looking in particular at white blood cell, well, so-called white blood cell. What is the major component? What particular um, cell is present? Is the most abundant white blood cell. So you'll find Monocyte. a lot of it in dead ones in, in pus. It begins with N. Monocytes. Right, monocyte is... You do have some there because the monocytes differentiate into macrophages. The macrophages, they actually, let's say at the site of a wound or infection, they will slide between the blood cell and get into your tissue and the macrophage, the macro, sorry, the macrophage, macrocytes, monocyte macrophage. The macrophages, they can then consume dead neutrophils and also any, um, uh, invaders there be it um, viruses or bacteria in a phagocytotic mechanism so that is true so i'm not mad at you but but they're not all that numerous and they don't die very quickly in terms of their lifespan is on the order of 30 days whereas this particular cell is on the order of hours neutrophils, neutrophils thank you very much neutrophils those are the most abundant white blood cells and they are their lifespan is on the order of hours so between three to ten hours and they're dead Right. So that's why you have so many of them. And when you think about pus, pus is really the accumulation of dead neutrophils and also dead um, bacteria or viruses or whatever is causing the insult. So that's what pus is. And quite rightly, it's a good thing when you see pus. It shows that your body working. 
as opposed to let's say you have an infection and you're not seeing any pulse, well, you know, <laughs> that means your immune system could be compromised. It could mean that, right? But pus is a, what pus is really representative of is dead in particular. The majority of pus is dead neutrophils, right? And it shows then that there was an infection. The neutrophils came to the site and they actually consumed all of, because they, they work by a phagocytotic mechanism as well, neutrophils, in terms of consuming the bacteria and then killing it within a, um, a lysosomal vesicle. And then they die. So that's why when they die and they accumulate, they form pus, right? Okay, that was very good, very good. So yeah, the monocytes, when they do get into the tissues, they um, differentiate and become macrophages. And these are these big cells that like to eat things, chum, 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 and break it down. So you were, you were partially correct when you said that. Well done. Okay, so this uh, shows then, as we mentioned there, in terms of the leukocytes, we mentioned them, the neutrophils, the lymphocytes, the monocytes that differentiate into macrophages once they get into the tissues, eosinophils and basophils, so-called because they have these granules in them. And of course, the platelets, very critical to the formation of um, clots, as we mentioned before. Right, so this is just looking um, at the numbers within the blood itself. When you do centrifuge it down, I look at the cell type. Erythrocytes, you have between five to six million. If I were to ask you, why is it you have so many erythrocytes? Why, why would you, why, what would you say? Because they are one word that begins with I. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Yes? Hello? Yep. Why do you have so many of them? Because let me ask you this question. We mentioned earlier on in top of class when we were looking at reproduction. And the reason why you're looking at the production of millions of sperm to one egg, the reason why you have so many is because reproduction is? Is that a biological? Important. Yes, yes. Important. And similarly, why you have five to six million red blood cells? Because carrying oxygen is important. What do we use the oxygen for? Oxygen is important for what reason in particular? To breathe, sir. To breathe, and we use that oxygen to do what with food? Let's say glucose. Energy, energy. Correct, derive energy. You use it to break down oxygen. So you have glucose, which is a form of a simple food, sugar. Right, plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Right, so you need to get that oxygen, it's critical. If you don't get those oxygen to the cells, it wouldn't be able to break down glucose or simple sugars to derive that energy. So that's why I have so many of these. And we mentioned here, all out of all of these the neutrophils, these are the most abundant, right? And they, because what do they do? They go around looking for invaders and chomp them up, right? And right behind them are the monocytes which as I mentioned, they differentiate into macrophages once they get into your tissues. So this is here, this is just giving some examples here. And what do they do? All right, hemostasis, right? So hemostasis in terms of uh, three components, vasoconstriction, so there it is, you have the rupture of a blood vessel, right? So hemostasis referring to this process. Formation of a plug, most critically, and coagulation, the hardening of that plug, right? So very critical. And in terms of how it occurs, you have the injury, you have the preliminary steps in the clotting. So you have this enzyme prothrombinase. It, uh, it accelerates the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin under the, um, under the guidance or in the presence of calcium. Thrombin now, this, uh, is important in terms of the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And these fibrin threads, they form like a mesh, very similar to a netting. And now let's say you're, you're draining pigeon peas to make a pilau. So you know you put it in the colander or the strainer and you run the water through it. Same thing like that happens in the blood. The strainer is really fibrin threads, you know, the, the mesh and the blood cells, which are like pigeon peas, they can't get through the strainer. And this leads to the formation of a clot. So all of these things are important, but most critically, right? These things don't happen unless you do have this injury to the blood vessel. And this starts this cascade of reaction, which ultimately leads to a clot. If you didn't have clot formation, what would happen to you? 
dot, 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 three letters. You'll bleed out. You'll bleed out. Hemorrhage to death. And that is very real. That is why it's very important that clotting occurs. All right, blood typing, right? Type A, B, A, B, and O. Right, very important in terms of these things. Um, there's a site I want to point you to. You can probably write it down. Uh, the Nobel, just type in, in Google, Nobel Prize Blood Typing Game. All right, N O B E L, Nobel Prize. In fact, it's on the e classroom. It's one of the things on the e classroom, but Nobel Prize Blood Typing Game, it's a very good way to concretize your knowledge as it relates to blood types. All right. So very importantly, uh, blood type A, B, A, B, and O. Right. So if you have these, you have these antigens. And of course, in the plasma, you'd have anti B. So these anti B will bind to B antibodies. Right. Very importantly, there. And of course, these are the types of um, patients, the blood types that you can actually. Um, take from. Just one thing to note when you're looking through, do remember, antigens, they're nothing more than proteins. They're just proteins. Anti but the antigen binds specifically to antibodies at these areas here, right? So the antigen, so for A antigen, and so anti-A antibodies, of course, they will bind to here, this region. So that's why you wouldn't want to have anti-A antibodies because they will attack your own blood. So that's why patients with type A blood, they have an, not anti-A, but anti-B antibodies present in the plasma, right? Because you don't want them to attach their own red blood cells because what these antibodies do, they could do one of two things. They could then signal, let's say, killer T cells to come in and um, to literally uh, destroy these red blood cells, right? Or initiate a, a cascade of reactions which could lead to apoptosis or destruction. All that being said, you wouldn't want your antibodies to attack your own red blood cell, which is why you have these proteins known as A antigens on the, red, on the type A blood, but in the plasma, you have anti B. You're not, you, because you don't want these to attach to these here. With type B, of course, similarly, you wouldn't want these attaching here. So you have anti-A antibodies. With AB, since they have both A and B antigens, you want, there's no antibody present in the plasma. And in type O, which is a universal, well, you can have either anti-A or anti-B because these have no antigens on their cell surface. Cell surface. Okay, then we move to some tissue here, right? What tissue are we looking at? This is cardiac. And one of the major ways you could tell is cardiac because of the presence of these intercalated discs as shown here, right? These little lines, right? And these intercalated discs, they accelerate the spread of the uh, action potential, which is generated by the SA node throughout the heart muscle itself. All right, the heart, you know, is a double pump. Here's a nice uh, image representing the heart. Blood comes in, do take note in terms of when you're looking at it, the flow of blood through the heart, that is important. Comes in by the inferior and superior vena cava, goes in and then moves in the pulmonary circulation to the uh, uh, lungs via the right and left pulmonary artery. Why do we have two set of arteries? Because we have two lungs, right? It then returns via the right and left pulmonary veins to the left side of the heart, the upper chamber, the left atrium. It then goes down and it then pumps out of the heart via the major artery leaving the heart, the aorta, all right? Two vessels you want to keep in mind, aorta and the superior and inferior vena cava. So we mentioned those chambers and the valves. That's an equation, very importantly. In terms of the conduction system, do remember five um, key components, the SA node, AV node, bundle of his, not the bundle of her, but the bundle of his and the Purkinje fibers. Let's have a look to see what they look like. Here's the SA node. This is the pacemaker. It generates the rhythm, right? And when I think about drums, you know, you think about, you know, Africa per se, you know, yeah, well, at least with me in terms of, of drum beats. So Africa and South Africa, you know, comes to mind, SA. So that's how I remember SA in terms of sinoatrial node. SA, South Africa, drums, beat, rhythm. This is the main pacemaker of the heart itself. So the SA node generates the electrical impulse. It goes down the internodal pathway, the AV node. And then from the AV node, it goes down to the bundle of His and then to the right and left bundle branches. It spreads via the Purkinje fibers to 
every cell of the heart. And why is it important? When you have an impulse going through, all of them, the impulse is like a drum beat. You know, it's a drum beat. And that drum beat, when the, all the cells receive it, they all in timing, just like when you're marching, left, right, left, right. They all get the signal. They all um, contract or relax at the same time. Bradycardia, tachycardia, bradycardia, slowing down, tachycardia, speeding up of the heart rate. And arrhythmia is an irregular heartbeat. All right, so blood vessel type, arteries, veins. Smaller arteries and veins, you have arterioles, smaller arteries, and ven venules, they are the smaller veins. And both of them are connected via capillaries. Important thing with capillaries, they are so one cell thick. So let's have a look at the artery and vein. The venule connects the both of them, and the capillaries are one cell thick. All right. So which vessels have valves that control blood flow? Is it arteries or veins? Asking that question. Which ones have valves that control blood flow? Mm -hmm. Veins, yeah. sir. Thank you very much. Veins, yes, 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 very good. All right, and this is just showing again another uh, example of what I just spoke of. Here's the capillaries between the arteriole and the venule. And ultimately, the venule gets larger and becomes a vein. The arteriole becomes larger and becomes an artery. Take note as well in terms of the diameter um, of the wall of the, in this case, we're looking uh, at a vein. The vein is thinner and that doesn't have much musculature, but the arteries, they have musculature, they have muscle in it, so they could actually contract the vein, the artery itself. Whereas the veins don't, the, the muscle layer is very thin. So that's why they, re they rely on valves to prevent the blood from flowing backwards. Whereas the arteries don't have to rely on that because they could squeeze it, they could squeeze the blood, you know, so they don't need valves for that. Here's the aorta, major artery coming out of the heart itself, the main artery, and the ascending aorta, you know, goes uh, above, and the descending uh, division goes to the lower parts of the body itself, right? And these are some of the major arteries associated uh, with the body itself. The major ones, facial, subclavian, brachiocephalic, uh, axillary, brachial, ulnar, radial, and superficial. And here you have the femoral, femoral because of name, because this is the femur it runs next to. Deep femoral, popliteal, right behind the kneecap to the back of the knee. And then you have, of course, your tibial, so named because of the bone, the tibia, or your shin bone, your shin bone. So there you have your tibial artery. Do remember, it is the tibial artery and not your shin bone artery. So if you write in your exam, shin bone artery, you will get it wrong. All right. I will laugh. <laughs> probably I might, if you're on a, on the, on the, on a, on a razor's edge, I'll probably give you a half mark for it because at least you got it in the right area. And associated with them is the veins. And the veins, if you were to look comparatively, um, the names are very similar to the arteries uh, in some instances because of their location. For instance, the ulna and the same femoral, you have a femoral vein and artery as well. Hepatic portal system, very important. It takes blood from the GI tract to the liver and it cleans the blood before putting it back into circulation. So from the hepatic portal system, it goes into the inferior vena cava, enters the heart and is then distributed throughout the body. So this is cleaning, the liver cleans the blood after it is taken, um, it is, it absorbs nutrients from the uh, digestive tract in terms of the uh, upper and lower digestive tract. All of these, if you look here, the descending colon, ascending colon, um, it takes the nutrient, it takes the blood, sorry, it takes the nutrients and also by extent could take some waste. So it has to run through the liver where it is cleaned and then it goes to the inferior vena cava before circulation through. So your hepatic portal system is really a cleaning up system for the nutrient, for the blood that comes from your digestive tract. Lymphatic, very importantly, the main functions returns uh, for fluid balance, 
protection, as you mentioned, houses and transports with leukocytes. Leukocytes, of course, being the white blood cells or the cells of your immune system, as one of your colleagues quite rightly pointed out um, before. It also, the lymphatics is important for the absorption of fats. And the reason why, because the lymphatic Oh, the opening to the lymphatic is larger than that which exists to capillaries. So therefore, in terms of absorption, um, uh, when you look at the lipids, they're slightly large. It they can be moved easier into the lymphatic as opposed to going through capillaries and being absorbed into your blood system. So that's why they go through the absorption of fats, go through the lymphatics as opposed to going through the capillaries, which are, which are associated with your digestive tract. All right, it's a one-way system, as you mentioned, and it drains into your bloodstream. This is important, this image here, it just shows the, in this area here, vessels in the purple, they drain into the right lymphatic duct and everywhere else they drain into the thoracic duct. So you'll be well pleased just to learn these, the, which ones drain into the right lymphatic duct, right, the axillary nodes, the mammary vessels, the right lymphatic duct, and then know that everything else drains into the thoracic duct in terms of the differentiation between the two. This is just an example of a lymph node. Should be able to label it if you do see it. And the location of the lymphoid organs, right? You have the pharyngeal tonsil, the palatine located um, just around the, that's the hard palate to the back of the um, uh, oropharynx. You have the thymus, your spleen, PS patches, which are in the in small intestine, and then you have the appendix, which is shown here. So these are the lymphoid organs. You should take note of their uh, locations. So what does the spleen do? Well, it cleanses the blood. It destroys all red blood cells, and it's also a reservoir for blood. In your professional career, particularly if there's trauma to the spleen as a result of, let's say, a gunshot wound, one of the things that is um, very characteristic of it is a lot of blood in the abdominal cavity. So if the person does get a wound to the lower torso and it, when you do open uh, the thoracic cavity and you do see lots of blood, uh, but of course you should pick it up in the x-ray as well. But it, one of the things that the um, that is hypothesized when you see a lot of blood is damage to the spleen. The thymus plays a key role in early immune, immune system development. And of course it shrinks after puberty. So interestingly enough, um, as you get older, this is one of the rare glands, the thymus gets smaller and smaller. Because of the fact your immune system is kicking in, those leukocytes which are produced in the bone marrow, the hematopoietic stem cells which are present in the bone marrow, those are the ones which are, in, which are uh, necessary for the generation of those, uh, not only red blood cells, but also the T lymphocytes, these leukocytes as well. Then you have, in terms of the lymphoid tissue, the malt, very important against infection. And again, in the gut, as we just looked at, you have the pious patches, the appendix, and the tonsils. These are gut-associated lymphoid tissue. They are known as gout. The mucosal ones, these are the ones which are associated um, with um, mucus production, and they do provide important barriers against infection and found in portions of the digestive, respiratory, and urinal genital mucus linings. You would recognize that all of these are lined with mucus in terms of these respective areas. So this is just showing the tonsils. Here's a nice view. When you do look in, when you say, ah, and you look into your mouth, the soft palate, and this here, this is your uvul ovula. And what this does, this actually blocks off the nasopharynx and prevents food from going up into your nose when you are eating. So that's the function of the ovula there. Here is your pharynx or your voice box. Uh, your larynx is your voice box, sorry. The pharynx is just the distal region of the, oral, of the oral cavity. This is your tongue down here. So your pharynx, not to be confused with your larynx, which is your voice box. Your voice box is a lot, is a little lower down than here. So this is just showing in terms of your lines of defenses. Of course, first line of defense is your skin. Then you have adaptive immunity, the T and B cells. Then your next line is the innate cells, the phagocytes. As we mentioned today, the neutrophils and macrophages in terms of phagocytotic, phagocytotic activity. The natural killer cells, again, um, in terms of antigen-presenting cells, uh, you have um, 
your basophils, your macrophages, um, and your dendritic cells. These are antigen presenting cells. So these are the ones, and when they do, they have phagocytic activity, they will engulf the uh, protein, the, sorry, the pathogen, and then they present parts of them to um, on MHC type one, sorry, MHC two receptors on the external part of the of the cell itself. Now, in the presentation of those cells, now you can have the natural killer cells could come along and recognize those um, those cell parts, and they could actually lead to destruction where that is concerned. Inflammation, very important in terms of fever, uh, fever. Which, which usually goes along with inflammation. The interferons are very important in terms of uh, being an intervener in this uh, system. And the complement, as the name implies, it's an alternate system, which also helps in the, um, the defense mechanism of the body itself. Oops. Cancer, oops, sorry. Right, the barriers, of course, you do have them all within your body itself, the innate barriers, and these are just mentioned here. So you have the innate barriers here. These are the pathogens, first line of defense, second line, and then you have the innate, which is a generalized um, protection mechanism. The adaptive, they are more specific, the T and B cells, you know, all of these before you actually get into your normal body cells. So very important to see how your body pre um, presents itself in terms of protection from different pathogens. All right, so here we have the respiratory system conducting air. And of course, the air passes through these parts here. And if we look at it here, we see these divisions, the nasal cavity to the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. Collectively, these form the pharynx. Or you could come in from the oral cavity itself, goes down into the lungs. Major. Uh, muscle associated with the lungs doing the diaphragm. Mediastinum, this is the area between the lungs wherein you do have the location of the heart itself. So the air comes in through your nares or your nostrils, filters down um, through your navel, nasal cavity. Mucus is produced in the nasal cavity. So this is one way in which the body prevents the introduction of pathogens into the body, it's into the um, lower respiratory tract. Then you have the larynx, very important for larynx and your trachea. Trachea, of course, for breathing, larynx in, uh, allows us that unique opportunity or ability to actually speak. When you get a little lower down into the lungs itself, here you have the alveoli. The alveoli come on the end of the bronchioles. Bronchioles, of course, they are subdivisions of the bronchi. Bronchi are then in and of themselves subdivisions of the trachea. So very importantly, gaseous exchange only occurs at the level of the alveoli, which are crisscrossed with capillaries. And these capillaries, one cell thick, allow the, and they have spaces within them, between them, and they allow the gaseous passage to occur. And here is the respiratory system here. All right, this is just showing uh, some of the questions that, that, you know, associated with the respiratory system. Right, name some of the structures associated with them. Define respiration and describe. Right, so these are these are just some of the questions. All right, now we come along to the lungs. So the lungs are rather important, right, in terms of their structure, right, and this is what I just spoke of in terms of the divisions associated with the lungs themselves. So general structure and function. So the division in terms of the functions, these are some of the functions associated with the digestive system, right? Digestion, absorption, and, and elimination. Very important, what you have to remember, the take home message from digestion is that the major things you do with digestion is really to break down food. And then when you break it down, you can now absorb the nutrients and eliminate any waste through the uh, anus and rectal area. So this is just showing some of the accessory organs associated with it. Salivary glands, teeth and tongue, very important for breaking down food, right? So digestion actually begins in the mouth where the breakdown uh, occurs, initial breakdown occurs. And then you have the GI tract, it goes from here, mouth pharynx, esophagus down to your stomach, 
small intestine, large intestine, and then out through the, in terms of fecal waste through the anus itself. The tract wall, the digestive tract wall, it is muscular as well. This is very important in terms of uh, alternate constriction and relaxation in a peristaltic movement allows for the movement or the flow of food down the entire passage. If that, if we didn't have this muscular area, what would happen? All the food would just remain within the digestive tract. And this is just showing some of the organs associated with the digestive tract itself, none more so than the stomach. Stomach has two um, sphincters associated with it. You have your pyloric and then you have the esophageal sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter. And this prevents food from actually leaving the stomach when digestion or breakdown of the food is occurring. All right, so that is important. Diaphragm, as you mentioned, very important muscle, more so when you look at respiration. Within the intestines themselves, very important to note, the intestines, they have these villi. And what these villi do, they increase the surface area for the maximal absorption of nutrients within the colon itself. So this is very important to take note of in terms of these villi being present to increase the surface area where food absorption can occur. This is just looking at the intestine. And again, you have the lacteals, very critical for the absorption, as you mentioned, of lipids. And the reason why they are preferably taken up in the lacteals as opposed to the surrounding capillary is because the opening in the capillaries are when you look at lipids, they're usually, they're, they're macroscopic, they're structure, they're large, very large. So they cannot really get into the spaces between the capillary cells, whereas the um, lacteal, they have larger spaces, so they could more easier get into the lacteals, and that's exactly what they do in terms of absorption of lipids. We are looking at here, we're looking at the accessory organs, our good friend, the liver. Right, large liver, and as you mentioned, liver is critical in terms of clearing or cleansing the blood once it is taken up from the digestive tract. Nutrients are taken up, right? So they then circulate via the hepatic portal circulation to the liver, returned via the inferior vena cava into the heart, and then they enter the systemic circulation. All right, metabolic activities, right? Two types. Anabolism cat, as I always tell you, cat, think about a cat. Cats like to rip things up. So catabolism refers to the breakdown, anabolism building up of complex things. And in terms of respiration, glucose catabolism within the cytoplasm, we're looking at generation of energy. And this process is known as glycolysis. As if you look at the word gly referring to uh, glucose and lysis refers to uh, the breakdown or the cutting up. So glycolysis, breakdown of glucose to yield ultimately ATP. The first part of, gly of glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm and two ATP per glucose molecule is recognized. The end product is pyruvic acid in terms of it. Then you have the aerobic phase in terms of glucose catabolism. This occurs in the mitochondria and it, it yields ultimately 32 ATP. Collectively, glycolysis yields 32 ATP per glucose molecule. And the end product is carbon dioxide and water. So this is just showing it. In the aerobic phase, you have 30. In the anaerobic, you have two. Anaerobic within the cytoplasm, aerobic within the mitochondria. Very important to take note, 30 ATP is generated per glucose molecule, whereas two is generated within the cytoplasm. All right, minerals. So we're looking at nutrients, very important. Minerals, very important for body structure, fluid balance, contraction, all of these things under the control of minerals. When we look at muscle contraction in particular, uh, what comes to mind, sodium and potassium, into the, uh, in, very important for muscle contraction. Vitamins, they're complex. Some are antioxidants, as we mentioned when we were looking not too long ago at the aging process as it relates to the end, uh, when you, after post-reproduction, the last chapter we're just looking at, vitamins are very important because they do stabilize free radicals. So in this way, they act like antioxidants. Right, and then you have the glycemic effects. 
right, is a measure of how rapidly a particular food raises the blood glucose level. There are certain things which would raise the blood glucose levels faster than others. So for instance, if you take potatoes, right, which is a complex carbohydrate, could be breaking down into sugars and it would raise your blood sugar level, but it takes a time, a little time for it to be broken down. We're talking on the order of hours. Whereas if you're taking something like a sugar cake, sugar cake, right, or something like apple juice, right, or rich in, 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 in juice, or your soccer, Julie Mango, right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're licking your elbow, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with all the juice, rich in sugars, this will actually have increased your glycemic um, index quite quickly, as opposed to a complex carbohydrate like dasheen or uh, yam or edos, that takes a little while before it's processed into sugars for it to raise your sugar level. Right, in terms of excretion, the major organs, of course, is your are your kidneys, but you also have other ones involved in it. And when we speak about the kidneys, we talk about the urinary system. We have a pair of kidneys. Why? Because it's good to have a backup. Left and right kidneys, the major structures or um, uh, blood structures associated with them, these are the renal arteries and vein, they go to the kidney itself and they are very important there. Cause the kidneys via the ureter, they avoid to the, they go to the bladder and then the bladder is voided via the urethra to the external environment. Right, so activities associated with the kidneys, excretion, right, homeostasis, very important of body fluids. So under the action of um, ADH, for instance, antidiuretic hormone, uh, which works at the distal parts of the, uh, distal parts of the kidney tubule, distal, um, distal convoluted tubule, um, it does allow, ADH allows, it increases the porousness of the distal convoluted tubule. So it allows for water retention in that regard, or if ADH is not secreted, um, it does allow for the retaining of water. Let's have a look at what ADH stands for. ADH, antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic is something that makes you want to release uh, water or urine in this case. So antidiuretic makes you keep it. So therefore, when you do have high levels of antidiuretic, you will retain water. Whereas when you don't have ADH, you will have copious amounts of urine being excreted. Oh, very, uh, I missed out here, EPO, erythropoietin. Um, this is very, uh, very important uh, hormone that is produced. The erythropoietin stimulates the, um, the bone marrow cells, the hematopoietic stem cells to produce red blood cells. So when it is recognized, for instance, that your um, oxygen content is going down, EPO is actually secreted and this could lead to the production of more red blood cells from your hematopoietic stem cells in your bone marrow. The increase in red blood cells then will lead to an increased oxygen carriage, which will then make up for the deficit of oxygen you're running. Uh, and this just speaks to the, um, the blood supply associated with the nephron. What is the nephron? The functional unit of the kidney. If there's one take home message, always to remember the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron itself. So as we mentioned in terms of urine formation, and again, ADH, reabsorption of water, we just spoke to that in terms of how ADH actually works. Then you have the juxtaglomerular apparatus here. Uh, very important as shown in this uh, structure here. And this is a whole nephron is, is being shown here. And it shows the location of this apparatus. And this then comes down to the sexual reproduction, which we spoke about uh, last week, by the male and female reproductive system, the very importance of those structures and pregnancy, which you also mentioned as well uh, last day. So I wouldn't um, spend any, any copious amounts of time on that, right, in terms of it. And that is the end of that. So that we just went through the, uh, the entire um, course there, and just, that was just a synopsis of it. So again, this will be made available on the, um, within a couple, within the next couple hours, it, I would post it up, I'll send it on the WhatsApp page as per normal and you could have a look at it, you know, at your convenience. Okay, all correct? Hello? Yes, sir. 
All right. Well, okay. So that is the end of today's class. Um, as I said, as the, the last, um, as the last uh, lecture that we had to finish, and we did do a bit of intro, um, revision there. As always, I will be available on the WhatsApp if you have any issues, and I would make myself available if you need be, if you need to go through anything else in particular. I will just pull a Zoom class, you know, and we could go through it. That is not an issue over the next uh, couple of weeks. All right. So do if you have anything like in terms of communication to me, as you're well aware, hit me up on WhatsApp. If it's very pressing, you could call. You know my number. Give me a call. And if you don't get through, you could leave a message so I'll know to get back to you where that is concerned. Okay. We good? Yes, sir. Oh, well, you're probably tired, eh? Yeah, this was a bit of a long one. But notwithstanding that, Hanifa, Alicia, Alia, Anissa, Avenel, Beverly, uh, Dixian, Doniel, Elizabeth. Hanifa, Johnny, Liana, Natasha, and Sophia has been my distinct pleasure and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Take care. Same to you, sir. Same Same to you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>